micronutrient deficiency poses a significant threat to the health and well-being of women and babies. After 20 years of research, we have got a product which is far superior than iron and folic acid. It is maternal micronutrient supplements for mothers. Multiple micronutrient supplementation is truly important, as in many countries, limited access to healthy and nutrient-rich food will affect the short and long-term health of mothers and babies. Unfortunately, today, in many parts of the world, women only receive iron and folic acid tablets, which contain only two essential micronutrients. On the other hand, multiple micronutrient supplements, which contain 15 essential micronutrients, provide for a superior birth outcome and a much better pregnancy. If we do not accelerate scale-up of MMS, lives will be unnecessarily lost. In Haiti, micronutrient deficiency poses a significant threat to the health and well-being of women and babies. To address this, Vitamin Angels is establishing in partnership with the Haitian government and the NGO sector strong delivery platform to scale MMS all over the country. We have multi micronutrition supplementation to expectant mothers or before pregnancy. Food direction and support, including collaboration between health workers, health cadres, and what we call the SAWISMA, is needed to ensure that we can reach all targets to obtain vitamin and mineral supplement. In Bangladesh, micronutrient deficiency prevails among women and children. To address this problem, Bangladesh has adopted national policies and guidelines on MMS. In addition, there are new guidelines inclusive of MMS in the process of development. The government of Mongolia has sta started allocating budget for nationwide multiple micronutrient supplements for children and women with 15 types of vitamins and minerals since 2019. The government budget on prevention of micronutrient deficiency was increased eightfold in 2019 to address the issue. The budget is directly allocated to primary healthcare facility to purchase micronutrient supplements for pregnant and lactating women and micronutrient powder for children from 6 to 23 months. To continue the momentum, we need collaboration. Together, as program directors, ministries of health, non-governmental organizations, researchers, and philanthropists, we have the opportunity to band together to ensure that every child is born to thrive. But in order to further advance maternal nutrition, public and private sector must work together even more closely and collaboratively so that we can address MMS affordability and accessibility gap, and so that all women and babies can thrive. We are committed to actively building partnerships and working collaboratively to improve the well-being of mothers and their babies. I stand for power for mothers. I stand for maternal micronutrient supplements for mothers. I'm looking forward to the launch of this Healthy Mothers, Healthy Babies Consortium so that maternal and child health can improve saving lives and creating thriving generations. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. My name is Saskia Ozenarp, and I'm the executive director of the Micronutrient Forum. And I'm so excited to see all of you, more than 650 who have registered and joining us here today. This has been a special week for maternal nutrition. Two days ago, we celebrated International Women's Day, a day that has a special meaning for me ever since I started working in nutrition back in 1995. Since the days of my PhD research in Dhaka slums, Bangladesh, I met with many young women and, uh, and mothers. Women such as Catherine here, whom I met at a growth monitoring session in Burkina Faso a few years ago. She had one infant on her lap, and a second baby on the way. And she was barely 16 or 17 years old. And I could not help but think about my own daughter, who was then about the same age as Catherine, 
and who I still consider to be a child. She was attending classes in school, had fun with her friends, and was building on her future. Now, we have all met women such as Catherine, somewhere in the world. Women who struggle to feed themselves and their children in the daring circumstances of a city slum or of the Sahel. Women who are strong, courageous, smart, and can become future leaders if only they would have had access to healthy diets, adequate health care, or um, to a good education. Now, this week also marked the launch of the new Lancet series on maternal and child undernutrition last Monday. And they made a strong case that we will have to step up our efforts in maternal nutrition because we are not making sufficient progress in maternal nutrition and maternal anemia. And yet we have interventions that are, that are effective and that are ready to be skilled. And the series particularly mentioned maternal multiple micronutrient supplements, MMS, as an intervention that's ready for prime time. So against the backdrop of these two events, I'm particularly proud that today, this webinar, we will officially launch the Healthy Mothers, Healthy Babies Consortium. The consortium will play a role as an advocate, a convener, a consensus builder, and a knowledge broker in all aspects of maternal micronutrient nutrition. The consortium can be a place for you, its members and stakeholders to connect with a community of global, regional and local uh, MMS advocates and stakeholders. Because together we can achieve so much more. Through collective action, we can achieve that more women will have a healthy baby and have healthy pregnancies. And I would like to thank uh, here before we start the current donors of the consortium, Kirk Humanitarian and SIF. And there are many, many people whom should be thanked for their support to this effort. But there is one person uh, without whose vision, commitment and investments, we would not have been able to start Healthy Mothers, Healthy Babies. And I would therefore like to express my sincere thanks and gratitude to Spencer Kirk of Kirk Humanitarian. Thank you, Spencer, for your passion and your vision and your leadership. And I would like now to hand over to Jane Bedden, our excellent moderator of today, to introduce you to the program and the lineup of speakers. Thank you. So hello everybody and thank you Saskia for those very clear opening remarks. I think if we've been waiting for a sign to act when it comes to multiple micronutrient supplementation implementation, then the new Lancet series, series is absolutely been it. So we have a great lineup today, two globally renowned scientists, two excellent professionals with first-hand implementation knowledge and experience, a global advocate, and the Micronutrient Forum program lead for the consortium. Just to let you all know that this webinar will be recorded and be made available online. And we ask you please to place your questions to any of our speakers in the Q&A box and continue to use the chat box just for introducing yourself to each other as we start together as a consortium. But let's get straight into it. And I want to start by welcoming our two scientists, Rebecca Heidkamp, who's an associate scientist at Johns Hopkins University Bloomberg School of Public Health, and was one of the lead authors for one of the papers in the new Lancet series that we've already mentioned, just released this week. Also with us is Emily Smith, who is the Associate Professor at the George Washington University, Milken Institute School of Public Health. And Emily is the lead author on one of the meta-analyses regarding the impact of multiple micronutrient supplements that was published in 2017. So Emily, if you'll also turn on your camera, lovely to see you and Rebecca with us. 
And I wanted to really start about with the Lancet series, so the newest Lancet series. So Rebecca, perhaps not everyone has had uh, the chance to read it yet. So I'm going to ask you if you can share some of the key findings related to maternal nutrition indicators mm -hmm. and the progress or lack of progress since the 2013 Lancet series. So let's hear a little bit about that from you to start with. Great. And, um, you know, I think in the, in the launch Monday, I talked about things being both hard and hopeful. And I think that really captures our situation with uh, maternal nutrition, especially uh, micronutrient status. So, you know, the data overall, in terms of we think about the progress towards the global targets, um, especially the target for anemia, is not great. Um, we don't have, we haven't seen the needle be moved on anemia. We've actually even seen slight increases of an anemia in women of reproductive age generally, a very, very small decrease in anemia among pregnant women. Now there's been some more recent you know, findings that have shown in some countries we're achieving progress of even about two percentage point declines per year, which is actually very exciting. So I think the hopeful part is even though over as a global, we're not seeing progress, we do see these kind of glimpses of, of hope that things are possible, it is possible to move the needle. Um, but I think the, um, and then kind of on the intervention side in terms of what can we do, again, it's hard and hopeful. So the hopeful piece, uh, I'll start there, is really, you know, this thing that, that maternal micronutrient supplements are ready for prime time. I mean, we have solutions. I think the challenge on the implementation side is we look at the data for IFA, so you've got about two thirds of women across low and middle income countries who are getting at least four antenatal care visits, but only a third of women are getting 90 days of IFA. So we look at that gap and say, it's an opportunity, you know, we need to scale, but it's also discouraging because these are the platforms through which we are going to introduce some of these other interventions. Absolutely, and I love your words, ho hopeful and hard. Nothing that's worth achieving in life is actually easy. So, uh, you know, I think that that's really important is that even though it's hard, that doesn't mean there is no hope. And Emily, I'm going to then turn to you for a minute because we've now heard a little bit from Rebecca on the mother's outcomes, but I want you to share with us a little bit about the evidence behind multiple micronutrient supplements in terms of the critical issue of the impact on birth outcomes? This is a great question. And speaking of hard work, folks have been researching multiple micronutrient supplementation since the 1990s. People in Zimbabwe and Tanzania and Mexico and Nepal all started these research trials in the early 90s and have continued for the last 30 years, which is pretty incredible. And now there have been 20 trials that include 140,000 women. And that's a lot of people where this has been studied. And just for comparison, if we look at IFA, the trials that, uh, that you know, informed us to use iron and folic acid, there were about 43,000 women in those trials. So when it comes to MMS, we've got a lot of evidence as compared to other things we typically do when it comes to improving health outcomes. So what did we find in these, these 20 trials? So we found when we put all of the data together that the risk of low birth weight is reduced by about 12 to 14% and preterm birth is reduced. So the risk of baby being born too soon is reduced by about five to 7%. And the risk of being born small for gestational age similarly is reduced about three to 8%. And even the risk of stillbirth is reduced. And so we see pretty consistently from country to country, from place to place, from time to time that, that really MMS compared to iron folic acid gives babies a better chance, a better start to life. That's just so much hope. Every one of those figures that you gave me just said hope, hope, hope. So Rebecca, when we then hear this, when it then comes to the interventions, what actually are we, are we saying? Because I see on our Q&A screen already, we have a question from someone who's asking us, do the multiple micronutrient supplements need to be given during pregnancy for the nine months every day? 
or is it expected for the first trimester or what is the starting point from preconception until pregnancy through pregnancy to delivery so let's hear what you have to say to that yeah and I, I might end up having to defer to Emily for parts of this but you know I mean I think you know what we found and this is actually true for iron folic acid um you know, we only find what we're looking for. So we've tested certain protocols. We've tested starting, you know, at a certain point in time, and we've seen what those outcomes are. In many cases, we haven't done the systematic work to know exactly, you know, when does this need to begin in order to get a maximum benefit. But we have to kind of deal with reality, which is that women show up for ANC um, at different times, right? And our goal is to get them there as early as possible and to intervene as early as possible. So I would say my general kind of um, principle, which I would love to hear Emily's take on, would be really work on getting women to ANC early. But then we saw there's this gap between women are getting to ANC, but they're not getting micronutrients. So really focus on ensuring the delivery channel is there and that when they come, those micronutrients are available. Emily, I saw lots of nodding from you. So let's hear from you. I totally agree. We do what we can when we can do it. And, and even we see this in the data that even if you start late, there's still some benefit. And that's because there's 15 different micronutrients in that multiple micronutrient supplement. And each micronutrient plays a different role at a different time in pregnancy. So starting early can be really helpful for something like folic acid and its impact on neural tube defects. But then again, a lot of the baby's growth the rapid acceleration of growth is happening in the third trimester, late in pregnancy. So some of the things that contribute to birth weight in that final big push for growth and brain growth, all of those things happens later in pregnancy. So yes, it's great if we can get MMS from before pregnancy, during pregnancy, after. Definitely, that would, that would be great. But at any time that a woman shows up to pregnancy or to shows up to antenatal care, it's a good time to start MMS. So that really leads very nicely into the next thought that I had, which is around the cost effectiveness. Because if we're going to say that we want women to have this, we want all women to have it, we want them to have it as early as possible in pregnancy, immediately I can see the thought is, but what is this going to cost and how cost effective is this? So uh, should we start with you again, Rebecca, on that one and then Emily as well? You might want to start with Emily because I think my side has a little bit more. I have a little more to think about. You know what to think about in terms yeah. of financing. Okay, it. let's start so, it immediately yeah. on the money. Speak yeah. to us about the money, Emily. Sure. So two issues on money. One is just affordability and how much it actually costs, which is different than cost effectiveness. Uh, so how much does it actually cost? Of course, it depends. But certainly there are people, Saskia mentioned Spencer Kirk earlier here, where who are producing this at approximately the same same cost as IFA or very close. So when you take those two facts, if you can get it for a similar price, but we have better impacts on things like reducing the risk of the baby being born too soon, too small, which of course has lifelong consequences for that, for that baby and eventually that kid and that adult. And so the, you know, the message is that it's very cost effective. In some of the specific modeling work has been done it so that we can compare it to other interventions. We see something uh, work for, for specifically for Bangladesh, for example, found that the cost was about $183 per death averted, which is quite cost effective when we compare it to other interventions. And then a range between $3 to about $13 per preterm birth averted. So if you are an economist in the weeds on these cost effectiveness work, check out the modeling. It, it turns out to be quite cost effective because of the increased benefit and because of the current production costs are relatively low. But that's all more good news, more hope, more hope. Rebecca, you want to add something to the cost story? Yeah, I mean, I think there's the cost side, right? But then there's the paying for it side. And I think, you know, Emily builds a really important case in terms of that concern is, is, is this going to be more expensive than IFA? And I think the general thought is, especially with economies of scale, the more that people get on board, the more we're producing, it won't. And so it is a more cost-effective intervention. You know, but the one piece we did do as part of the Lancet series was looking at financing for nutrition. So this is in terms of, but what money is really being put out there? And I think you know, the World Bank had projected an increase of about $7 billion, $70 billion over 10 years additional in order to meet the WHA targets, which includes the anemia target. And 
you know, I think one of the concerns is that we've seen some evidence that that, that assumption was that domestic financing, the money coming from governments towards their own nutrition programs was going to increase over time. And we've actually seen some evidence of actual domestic financing decreasing. So I think there's both the, the question of cost, but then there's actually the political will to finance and to actually put resources towards this, which is something we're concerned about across um, the nutrition spectrum. I really think that's also really important because so often we do just talk about costs saying it's cost effective, uh, but we've got to find the reality of show me the money and, and see, it, see it absolutely happening, which also links to us when we say show the money. Uh, we've got a question here on our screen as well from one of our participants. Um, and let me pose it to you to start, Emily. When do we expect to have WHO explicitly favor MMS over IFA as we see this global move and we've seen the wonderful results you've shared with us? Yes, so WHO can only make new recommendations as new information becomes available. And so in fact, we saw that move from the 2016 ANC guidelines, which said that MMS was recommended or wasn't recommended, but that countries with high burden of nutritional deficiencies might consider it. And now we saw this update at the end of 2020 that says it's recommended in the context of rigorous research. And aside from being a researcher, I love research, uh, but this is great news because we don't know a lot about how to do it well. So like Rebecca mentioned at the beginning of this call, even with IFA, we're not doing a great job of getting those supplements into the hands of women and getting them to use, you know, take them every day. And so the same problem will apply to MMS. So the, in the context of rigorous research, which WHO has recommend, you know, changed that recommendation now, I think this makes sense for us to learn as we start to implement here. And I think we'll hear more about that from, from other partners. Later. Yes, I think we're going to hear that from our country experiences. Let's face it, we're all learning while doing. And boy, has the last year been the biggest learning curve. So maybe this next question from one of our participants, and I'm not sure who of you wants to answer it, but uh, let me put it to you to start with, Rebecca, is what is the minimum dose and duration of MMS during pregnancy to reduce low birth weight? So maybe, Emily, this also might be you from the, the meta-analysis rather, and then Rebecca can add. Rebecca, you okay? I'll go to Emily first and come back Great. to you. Hand it over to Emily, please. Yeah, what's the minimum? The short answer, I don't know. We see some trend. More, better, less, not as good, but we still are seeing benefit in these studies where a few of the studies were kind of pragmatic trials, I would say. They were trying to, to see what would happen just when women were regularly showing up to ANC, like the great work done in Indonesia, and they still find benefit. So look, is one day too short? Probably. But uh, is four weeks too short? I don't think so. So even if a woman is showing up later, it's still a time because of course a woman herself has, we're thinking about health, her own health and what she's about to do, uh, giving birth and you know, feeding, breastfeeding babies, all of these things take energy, take micronutrients. And so any, any bit helps, that's the trend. And maybe I would just add, you know, I think um, you can think about the duration of supplementation, but also the dosing itself. So I'm not quite sure what the, the person asking the question had in mind, but, you know, we do have um, the Minimap formulation kind of as our starting point, And that's what many of these trials have been done with. And while, I mean, of course, I mean, I think especially Emily and I as scientists, we're all about precision, right? And refining and, and trying to find exactly the right thing. Well, I think that is stuff that can happen potentially over time, right? But this initial political will, we've got a good starting formulation that is shown to have impact. Let's think about delivering that. And then if there's space as time goes on, research and refining and countries can be places that innovate over time as they're, as they're working on this. Um, well, that's great that you touched on that, Rebecca, because the very next question that I want to get to uh, from Phil James is, does MMS for women equals Unimap globally, or do you advocate for tailoring of doses and the micronutrient ingredients according to the context? So we can start with you, Rebecca, and then see if Emily wants to add. I think my big concern would be that in order to tailor anything to context, we need two things, right? We need 
evidence of what that context is. And I think this is one of the key messages that we've seen that the, the data on micronutrient deficiencies in countries is really sparse. So the truth is we, in many places, don't know what gap we're actually trying to fill technically to make it very context specific, right? We know that generally, um, and we have to think about safe levels of, of, of micronutrient intake. We've got to think about, there's all sorts of biological factors. Um, so I'd say, you know, in that gap, you know, I think starting with where we are is really important. In theory, would it make sense that things get refined to context? Yes, but I just, I have a feeling that's one of those things that's almost more theoretical than it is practical. Emily, do you want to add anything to that? Absolutely. And I see a second question that's closely related. Exactly. Which so is, answer think, that. Yeah, the only place where there is existing evidence varying the formulation really is around the iron dose, which is was another question asked. So in these 20 trials, some of them used an MMS, the Unimap formulation with 30 milligrams of iron. Some of them used a formulation with 60 milligrams of iron. And in fact, that's pretty consistent with what's happening with iron and folic acid around the world. Some countries use 30 milligrams, some countries use 60 milligrams. We actually don't, I don't have enough evidence to say one is better than the other. And in fact, it surely matters where you are. So for example, if you're in Ethiopia where we know there happens to be a lower prevalence of iron deficiency anemia because of the diet and the groundwater and things like that, then probably you're already using the 30 milligrams of iron dose and it makes sense to consider it. Now in other places, if you know you have a high burden of iron deficiency anemia and you're using 60 milligrams of IFA, for me, that makes sense. Keep, keep it as it is if that's what you think is best for your, your context. So there's no reason, that's the only place where I think there's some varying amount of evidence. Now, if you wanted to get in, into all of the other nutrients, say copper or selenium or vitamin K, I, my, I professionally review all of this evidence. There's not a lot of good evidence. So it's a great theoretical question. And I hope to do more of that kind of research myself. Uh, but I don't, I don't foresee the necessary evidence being available now to make that happen. So perhaps as we come towards the end of this time, boy, time rushes when you're sharing hope and good news. Uh, I want to uh, come to another question from one of our attendees that says, there really is this lack of compliance. Emily, you touched on it already with both IFA and any other maternal supplementation program. So is there any supportive research that you're aware of on how we can perhaps enhance the appearance, the shape, the offering, or something to enhance compliance? Is there anything around that? Rebecca, let's start with you. Yeah, there actually is evidence. And I think there's some really great implementation and research around this out there. And you know, some of the strategies that have been promising are, first of all, just really good counseling. I mean, it's true that a lot of um, women really do trust their health providers. And we know that you know, giving good having the time and the kind of skill set to deliver counseling about why and how to take something that women women need that information. And so making sure we're doing good counseling. There's also been some really promising things about things like compliance partners, you know, having someone just like we all do, I think when we're trying to have a habit, you know, identify a family member that helps them with ensuring that they're taking their medicines. There's there's lots of things out there in terms of of what can be due to increase compliance. I think one of the hard challenges is how do we scale those and actually make sure they're being systematically used. You're so right, Rebecca. If I hadn't had a gym buddy when I started mm -hmm. doing my gym, I would have given up long ago. And even through COVID, as we uh, pivoted to Zoom, my gym buddy was important to make sure that I kept moving. Emily, we've got just one minute left. Is there anything you want to add uh, to that about the forms? Yeah, I think this is the place where rigorous research and anything you know, this is not something I, I can advise on, but you know your country, your context to learn about this, about what might look work best, how that counseling could work, if there's anything about the way we give it to women, things like this, all of these. And I know there are, is a lot of ongoing research that we can all learn and share those, those learnings together to make sure we make it the best best experience for a positive pregnancy experience for, for all women. 
And this is really where everybody, and we're going to talk, that's why it's a consortium, because it's about collaboration. So this is where we need people who don't only work in the pure science, like the two of you who are hugely valuable, but people working in innovation and coming up with new ideas and thinking out the box, how to really make this work. It's been wonderful having both of you with us. And I do want to say to all of our uh, attendees, don't worry if we didn't get to your questions, because all the questions are being uh, recorded and kept, and you are going to see that they will be compiled into a question and answer document that will be made available on the web website, and you'll all get to know about it. So there never is enough time, but thank you so much to the two of you, and you might even find that Rebecca and Emily answer some of the questions when they go off camera now and can look in the in the Q&A box. So Emily and Rebecca, thank you so very much. Thank you, Jane. We know there's the evidence. Now we really need to make sure we see the action. But remember that when we talk science, it's always good to remind ourselves, in this case, of the exact woman that we're talking about who need the interventions. And so we're going to show you a short video from Bangladesh. Dekhen to, amar ei baccha ta koto rishtopushto hoyse. Ei baccha shomoye doctor apa onek gulo vitamin ola je kotar bore gulan dishlo, oi ta amar onek kaaje dise. Prothom santane shomoye jodi ami ei bore khaitam, amar baccha ta amar emon roga badla hoyto na. Ami oi shomoye onek shusto thakte partam. So we see there a mother telling us that taking these tablets really made her happy because she felt she had healthier children. That's what it's all about. So we've now heard about the science. We know that many countries have started uh, with the support of nutrition partners, multiple micronutrient supplementation projects to really be able to explore the use of MNS in the countries. So what we're going to do now is move to two wonderful women with Women Day. It's lovely to see so many women up who come from the countries that we might be able to call the early adopters for multiple micronutrient supplements. So let me start off by uh, welcoming Lenore Spies. And Lenore is a former nutrition officer within the South African government and is currently an independent consultant. And then also wonderful to invite and welcome Yumi Setinwati, who is a senior research officer at the Summit Institute of Development in Lombok, Indonesia. So these are two women who have real practical experience of taking it from the science to the programs. So great to have both of you uh, with us. I'm going to start with you, Lenore, and I'm going to, because I really think the enabling environment is so critical, and we've heard we can have all the evidence we, evidence we need, but I want you to share with us the context in which multiple micronutrient supplements were introduced in the province of KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa a number of years ago. We'll subsequently talk about what happened to the program, but just tell us what was the context that you started with multiple micronutrient powders? Thank you, Jane. Uh, and, and good afternoon and hello to all the participants. Well, for us, Jane, it was way back uh, in 2010, uh, most of the you will know that uh, South Africa and specifically KwaZulu-Natal has been the epicenter of the HIV epidemic. And we were able, in the context of that, uh, government received a lot of funding around, you know, conditional grant funding around HIV. And uh, we were able then to put forward quite a good case for uh, the use of micronutrient supplementation, specifically for pregnant women to be done routinely simply because at that time in 2010, we were only um, implementing ARVs on a CD4 level basis. You had to have a particular level of CD4 threshold. 
And so it was quite easy for us to motivate in terms of the, the nutritional status of pregnant women, uh, the need for these uh, micronutrient supplements. And uh, because there was funding available and at the time, you know, in the country, there was really open-mindedness and a strong, you know, political leadership around what we should be doing and trying with this real um, high population of HIV positive pregnant women that we should uh, try, you know, new things. So we were very encouraged by that type of leadership. And so we took the plunge and that's what we did in 2010. And it really was, you know, just really open and understanding and broad in terms of the context. Of and I think expect. that you are also being very humble, but also part of that commitment and political will was you personally as then leading nutrition in that province at the time. So I do want to say, I think always having a champion is, is really critical. And yes. you in the, this case were that champion. And I'm going to come back to you, but let me come to you, Uni, because uh, we also really need to talk about strengthening uh, MMS implementation. You know, it's one thing Lenore talked about it happening, and we'll come back to her as to why it stopped. But I really believe that the Summit Institute of Indonesia is one of several nutrition actors in Indonesia working to get a better understanding of how MMS transition can be most successful. So share with us a little bit about your story. All right, thank you, Jane, and all the participants. Uh, so from our side, the um, Summit Institute for Development, especially um, initially worked with MMS uh, when the summit trial was done in uh, Lombok Island. So in that study, uh, that's the large study on the randomization trial on the MMS uh, that's designed to get the infant mortality to assess the infant mortality. So in that study, it's shown that uh, the major uh, found of the MMS is to reduce the infant mortality and also to reduce the children mortality, especially for those women who are anemic. And moving forward for that, that important study, we're also working with uh, to know the evidence on uh, how to embrace the, um, the women in, in this case. So we, we was done also the a survey on the preference of the multiple micronutrient supplement. So in this case, we embrace the women's uh, preference uh, on what kind of uh, MMS they would like to consume and uh, how it likes and what what's the uh, like organolactic uh, preference they would like to see in the MMS they consume. So in this case, there are three things. Uh, the first one is the halalness is the most important one. Because you know that Indonesia is kind of um, the largest Muslim countries that uh, all of the things that should be considered halal. It's not only about the product itself, but also the manufacturing process also. And the second thing we found that uh, about the shape and uh, about the formulation, uh, uh, I mean, the, the shape of the MMS itself, it should be like uh, the round and with pink color uh, capsules and will be packaged uh, into a 10, uh, count blister package, it's more preferable, preferable among women in Indonesia. So in this case, uh, in that preference survey, we know better about how women's uh, preference on the MMS. And next also, we have also uh, do the uh, distribution of MMS integrating into the health system that already exists in Indonesia. So, uh, Yuni, let me just come back, follow on with that, and then I'm going to come back to Lenore, because there is a question from uh, Zafinia, which actually was a question I also had down, which is, we even know that with the iron and folic acid, we have quite low compliance. So we can't necessarily say that this intervention will necessarily lead to higher compliance. You've just touched on some of the things, but what specifically are you currently doing to avoid the low compliance and adherence to multiple micronutrient supplements? You've mentioned the halal, but I think that probably wasn't applicable with iron folate. You've mentioned kind of the shape and the color. Tell us a little more. Uh, all right, for the shape and the color, yeah, you're right. Uh, there's also the preference on uh, like the IFA. It, it doesn't really create 
uh, based on what the preference of mothers or the, or the women. But for the MMS that we distributed, uh, especially in the summit, is that uh, the round shape um, in the capsule is not a tablet. And also the color should be pink and it's uh, packaged in a 10 count of blister uh, foil. And this is distributed uh, by the, uh, uh, the midwife in the village. Uh, we, this is the, the system that already uh, exists in Indonesia. So mothers are doing the antenatal care services with this uh, midwife village, uh, the village uh, midwives. Uh, apart from that, we also embrace the, uh, we involve also the cadres. Cadres is like the community health workers that also work to help us in distributing and also to monitor the adherence of the MMS consumption among mothers. So this is this this is the important things that we noticed that uh, to the success of the uh, adherence on the MMS consumption. Great, Uni, thank you. Lenore, I'm coming back to you now because we've heard now how uh, Indonesia is working to make sure that they, they have acceptance of the program. And now we know that sadly in South Africa, the program stopped. So I'm going to ask you, because we can learn so much from our failures and yet we often don't talk about them. But can you share with us some of the reasons that it stopped and what you think has been learned from that experience about using multiple micronutrient supplementation in women. Okay, so uh, thanks, Jane. So the first thing I think, and the biggest thing was that in about in 2016, South Africa moved from, in terms of the HIV policy, from uh, ART initiation based on CD4 to test and treat, which is now the standard for any ARV program, testing and treating. And uh, with that movement to test and treat, the, the motivation for the inclusion of MMS became very weak and, and fell away because the motivation linked was on nutritional supplementation while they're waiting to be put on ARTs in one of the big reasons. And uh, linked to that, because that happened, the secondary effect was is that the micronutrient supplementation was removed from South Africa's what we call EML or an essentials medicine list which means in South Africa, if a particular product is not in the EML, you have to have quite detailed submissions and motivations to use it. It's not an ease of use product. So which means it became very cumbersome, the pharmacy wouldn't stock it. And so they just, you know, it wasn't available for use at the primary healthcare level within our clinics or pre And then finally, while we try to pick it up at that time, there was just, um, there are nine provinces in South Africa and there were three of nine provinces implementing it. We were in the largest in terms of scale, but the other two provinces, the Eastern Cape and Northern Cape were implementing it on a sort of a more limited basis. But in the absence of this national policy guidance, because we were doing it as a province, as well as any international policy guidance. This was 2016. We were trying to, you know, we had started something in 2010 as a routine thing, not specifically. So we were sort of beginning to grapple in 2016 with a sort of a big lack of support, both nationally in terms of, you know, national support to make this happen as a province, as well as internationally in terms of what is the available evidence saying, where should we start, how should we do it now, because what we had used initially to motivate it had now began to fall uh, a little I'm bit. I'm sure as you hear and read about the new Lancet series, you really yes. say, you're saying, yes. oh, if I only said. I'd had it back yes. then, if yes. only. But hopefully, yes. Lenore, and I'll come back to you on it, hopefully you'll be able to say how you think this study, uh, these, this release of the series and the way mm -hmm. the world is going, uh, you might, might be able to do something for South Africa. But before yes. I go yes. back to you on that, I'll give you a chance to think about it. Uni, okay. we have a lovely question from uh, Rina who says she'd really like you to share with us about the success story of what you've achieved in Lombok and how is it now being used by the local government? Really important, especially in a country like Indonesia, so large, so decentralized. Uh, how have you really got it used by the government in Lombok? Share that with us. All right, thank you for the nice question from the Torina. So actually, uh, the implementation of MMS is um, not really fully implemented yet. 
especially in the um, Lombok, uh, in the Lombok, uh, it's partly uh, implemented by the government here in Lombok because uh, the, the there's many consideration for that. But I will I will um, uh, give some success story about this. We also uh, integrate the distribution of MMS in Lombok into the digital system called uh, OpenSRP platform. So in this OpenSRP is like um, uh, integrated digital system that um, enable the real time sharing between uh, frontline health workers in primary health center between the midwives, nutritionists, and also the even the cadres itself. So in this platform, the all information promotion and also the um, reminders of the MMS consumption is also integrated into the system. So it helps us to also monitor and uh, to track the adherence of the MMS itself. That's really wonderful using technology as well so that we do everything we can to enhance uh, the compliance. Uni, there's also a question here as to whether um, you have anything in uh, perhaps published or in process around the kind of how the pink colored tablet affected the compliance and adher adherence. Is there anything yet in the literature around that that you've published? Yeah, it's actually based on our uh, preference survey that's been uh, that was done previously. So we we will scale up also the uh, the survey into more large um, participants, so we can know better about the uh, the preference of mothers. So, in this case, the pink uh, it can be represent of the color that, that more preferable by women to consume uh, the MMS because mostly what we found in the market that the the supplements doesn't have any um, good color on it. So it might be uh, less uh, attractive by uh, women to consume that uh, supplement. So from that, uh, from that uh, lesson learned, we try to get more evidence on this, uh, how to embrace women as the beneficiaries or as the um, target for the MMS can uh, get involved in the, and to choose what kind of MMS actually uh, more preferable for them to consume and uh, to take in a day day. Thanks so much. And Clayton has made a very, Clayton uh, from Vitamin Angels and uh, the Micronutrient Forum Steering Committee, if I'm correct, has also made a comment that there is lots of implementation research going on now. And that's what's really exciting. Nano, I'm going to come back to you and Uni, you're going to get a chance to prepare for the answer because I'm going to ask the same question to you after I ask Lenore. Lenore, if you think now about all the challenges that you faced and what you know now, what do you think you would do differently or what do you think could happen now to really perhaps get the South African government to revitalize and reconsider again? Uh, well, I think for me, Jane, the biggest, it's five years on now. And for me, the biggest game changer is the emerging evidence now. I mean, South Africa takes a lot of their, lead, their direction in terms of policy development from international organizations, specifically WHO and UNICEF. And at the time, there was just a lack of that strong direction around MMS and pregnant women. And so I think five years on now, we've learned that uh, this information is now available and now we can really look at it. And I think that uh, in South Africa, we were able to show that uh, we've got quite a strong uh, health system in terms of um, adopting this particular initiative. So we were able to uh, do the issues around procurement, distribution, you know, the manufacture happens in South Africa. So we were able to demonstrate that those particular logistical issues around making sure women get it, we can overcome those. So we sort of have gotten those out of the way now. What we need to deal with now is the policy environment. We've also, and I think that, you know, we've gone through a, in South Africa, a particularly bad phase of COVID. You know, we've been with some of the worst statistics and the data shown that um, there's been a lot of uh, discussion around hunger and poverty, especially during COVID. So I think in terms of, the political world now is the time. The time is right. There's political world. It's highly topical. You know, we can we can really move forward quickly. 
And the most important so thing... Would you say, Lenore, that then the real benefit that the consortium could bring to South Africa would be really highlighting uh, the evidence that's been shown and being able to really put before a government like the South African government uh, the evidence? That would be a real benefit for a country of a consortium like this? Absolutely, and to make it sort of country specific for us, you know, we want to see that this has happened. So to be able to show that we've implemented it, we have the capability, would be a huge plus if you take it forward. And I think we have got excellent opportunities now. We are busy now rewriting the maternal child out neonatal policy. It has been revised and updated. And we're actually just revising and updating after eight years, the infant and young child feeding policy after eight years. And these are like... They are 2021, the year, they now, they, the opportunity, the, the Lancet series has come out. You know, we're getting stronger and stronger. And I think we should really just seize these opportunities because they all seem to be just coming together at a particular opportune moment. And that's so exciting, especially considering all the work that you put into the initial phase. So uh, wonderful that we can see the consortium having a real role to play. Uh, Uni, I'm going to go to you then just to share with us if you think back, and we had a question uh, from one of our participants as well, is especially if you think of the introductory phase of kind of your project, what would you also do differently now? And where do you think the consortium could play a role to really help Indonesia scale this up and to move it to the next level? All right, thank you. So for, uh, for now, we, uh, we closely engage uh, local governments, uh, even the Minister of Health of Indonesia, to work together on the uh, uh, to scale up the MMS. And also we are approaching also the local manufacturing actually for uh, producing uh, the MMS who will embrace the women's preference that we mentioned before. So with this engagement and also working closely uh, together with the local partners and local governments, we hope that the scaling up of the MMS can be, um, can be uh, go faster instead of just working uh, lonely or, or even if the consortium can help us uh, to adjust the local context uh, where the MMS will be distributed and will be uh, used in Indonesia it will be more helpful also. Really appreciate you both, uh, both Lenore and Uni. Uh, you've really made it clear to us that the evidence for impact exists. But what we've heard from your country stories is that actually implementation can be hard. I'm going back to Rebecca's word of hard, but you are both feeling really hopeful that now is the time where we can absolutely see that shift. So I'm going to put you under pressure for one last moment. If you had to ha be quoted in a tweet by our social media gurus, on what you have, what you feel about the implementation of multiple micronutrient supplements, what would your very quick tweet be? I liked yours. You started with the time is now, Lenore, but I'll let yeah. you have an opportunity uh, to add to that. Lenore, you first. Um, oh, okay. So I said the time is now. I would also say that we just need. Um, you know, strong, decisive leadership, lots of coordination, and um, just support from all sectors, from the ground up, you know, creating demand from communities, nobody should be excluded. And if we do this collectively, I'm sure we'll get there. Lenore, that was perfect. You've given us lots of lovely words and ammunition from it. And we thank you for your <laughs> commitment over the years uh, to, to this area. And we hope that you're going to uh, be able to report back at some point on how South Africa has really taken and run with it. Uni, what's your uh, tweet going to be for us to use on social media? All right, Summit Institute for Development believe that the future of MS is bright as go beyond low cost manufacturing uh, process to a new generation of high impact affordable uh, supplements that uh, embrace women's preference and also integrated into digital health system that already exists in the effective system of care at scale. Another perfect one, what wonderful speakers. So Uni, thank you to you as well for sharing with us. We've heard about the science, we've heard about the implementation,
So now we're going to move on to the advocacy. And who better to hand the floor over to now than Andy Rigsby. Uh, and Andy is the Senior Program Officer for Global Policy and Advocacy at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Andy, I'm sure you're feeling as energized as I am by what we've heard from our scientists and from our implementers. But what's really exciting is we've got the Nutrition for Growth, or in for g as everybody knows it, coming up. You're going to share with us your thoughts and feelings around what this offers us as an advocacy moment. So over to you, Andy. Yeah, absolutely sounds good. And, and what I've loved about being on today's webinar is that we've got scientists and program implementers that are also clearly really talented advocates and communicators. And that's, I think, most critically what we're going to need to move this agenda. I think it's helpful just, you know, nutrition for growth for, for folks who aren't as familiar to step back and really think about how this fits into the broader landscape of advocacy opportunities for an issue as specific as MMS. You know, if you look back to the original Lancet series in 2008 and 2013, one of the things that they identified in addition to those priority interventions was that we lacked a harmonized global architecture for nutrition. We lacked financing for nutrition. Nutrition didn't have its own major global fund or funding moment. And so nutrition for growth itself, just like MMS as a recommendation, came out of the Lancet series and in the original moment in 2013, raised $4 billion for nutrition-specific interventions and additional $23 billion for nutrition-sensitive. We're now coming up on another one of those moments, but building on the evidence that has grown over the past decade, the Lancet launch last, yesterday that shows that we have renewed and more and more nuanced data on MMS, it's our job to make sure that that next wave of funding includes specific provisions for maternal nutrition broadly and a package of maternal nutrition interventions that includes MMS as a key important uh, component of that. I think the other important thing to note is that, uh, you know, Nutrition for Growth, it isn't just about the financing commitments, it's also about policy commitments and program commitments. And I'm happy to come back to those. But what that means is that any actor, whether you are coming from the private sector, whether you are a government or a donor or a UN agency, every single one of us from our respective institutions has a role to play as an advocate, as an influencer, but also potentially as a pledger who can, even if we don't necessarily have the resources, we have policies uh, that we are a part of, that we co-create and that we contribute to. So when we look at the moments in 2021, there are really two, many folks might know that the government of Canada hosted a kick up kickoff moment in December uh, that was a good kickoff to a nutrition for growth year of action. Uh, upcoming this year, we have the UN Food System Summit and you know, there's a lot of attention on the Food System Summit. And I think for health and nutrition advocates, there's a little bit of a question about where do we fit in? And my number one piece of advice would be, don't wait to be asked to the party, go to the party and bring, bring your special cocktail or hors d'oeuvre. In this case, it's MMS and, make, and it's maternal nutrition and make sure that the UN Food System Summit is delivering for health and nutrition outcomes because a food system summit that doesn't do that isn't going to be successful. And we've gotta be the guardians of that agenda. I think the second opportunity at the food system summit is you know, they're looking at game-changing solutions for how we can really accelerate progress rapidly. And these game-changing solutions can't just always be delivered through the food systems alone. They need food systems and health systems to be working together to succeed. A good example would be a focus on anemia. So if the food system is going to start to deliver the nutrient rich crops, the large scale food fortification, but they're gonna do it without the MMS uh, and the supplementation that's required, we won't be successful at reducing those game changing ideas around anemia. So we need to put ourselves and our issues within the context of these bigger concepts and make sure uh, that they're deeply embedded in bigger agendas. 
Finally, is the Nutrition for Growth Summit in December of 2021 uh, at the end of this year, hosted by the government of Japan in Tokyo. Um, that will be our opportunity for a capstone moment to look back on an entire year of action, the Canada event, the UN Food System Summit, everything that happened in between. And for anybody that didn't have an opportunity to pledge prior to December, that will be the moment to make sure that we as advocates have helped move our counterparts in government, national policies and strategies, donors who are better aligned and funding the things that countries are demanding in their national strategies, and that that all gets delivered in one uh, a nice culminating moment here at the end of the year. Andy, I just love how you, you've really wrapped that up for us. And I think what just stands out in what you've said, and you said it so many times that we must not forget it, was you used the word we. If we're expecting anybody else to do it for us, we're going to be deeply disappointed. So it's up to each one of us. And even if you think, but I'm not an advocate, you are. Each one of us has to find the moment where we can be the person that sparks that action. So Andy, you're going to get to give me a tweet to go out on social media uh, from you as we close off with your remarks. So Andy, what's your great social media tweet? My tweet is MMS is the obvious choice for healthy mothers and healthy babies, and it's our job to deliver. It is our job to deliver. So thank you so much, Andy, for sharing the excitement and the energy that there is for nutrition. I, uh, by the color of my hair, you can tell I have been around in nutrition for quite a while. And to me, this definitely is another one of those moments. I think the start of the sun movement was another one of those moments in time. And we've really got to grasp them in both hands. So really, thank you so much for reminding us how we, the people, and the community of nutrition will make it happen. So thank you very okay. much, Andy. Happy to. And I'm now going to hand over to Marty van Leer, uh, who is leading uh, the Micronutrient Forum uh, Consortium on Healthy Mothers, Healthy Babies. And Marty, I'm excited to hear from you as you share with us some of the details about the new consortium. So let's hear about the exciting moment we have today. Thank you, Jane. And um, to everybody, um, you've heard from these wonderful speakers, um, a number of essential perspectives, right? They frame the health issues around maternal nutrition. They laid out a growing evidence base that supports an urgent introduction of MMS. And we heard also that when we're introducing MMS, we really need to integrate it in existing antenatal care services, but also strengthen these services and increasing compliance and adherence. And not to forget the challenge of allocating domestic resources. Now, Marty, sorry, before you continue, I want to remind everyone, don't forget if you've got questions as Marty speaks, stick them in the chat in the Q&A box for us, please. Thanks, Marty. Okay, um, I actually also asked my, co my colleague to put in the, um, in the chat box a link to the Connected Conference, because if you're interested to hear more about MMS, the evidence or the implementation progress, please know that all the content of the Connected Conference is now open access and you can just go there and just listen to all these wonderful sessions again. Now, for me, I am really thrilled that we're launching this consortium today because this is the first time that we have an entity that is entirely dedicated to maternal nutrition that will help us to drive this implementation of cost-effective maternal nutrition interventions better. And then we start with scaling of MMS. My role, as Jane said, is to provide you an introduction to the consortium. And I will lay out the mission and the vision, the guiding principles, I will talk to the organizational design and also um, why this is important. I will also, um, one moment, um, I will also um, talk about our initial priorities and activities in the months ahead. And I use this word initial purposefully because though we at our side, we have outlined somehow the work plan for this year, you can help shape us to make this a collective agenda. So going to the mission and the vision, in the next slide, I actually 
will read them out loud. This is the only time I'll read a slide out loud. The vision statement is that we want to ensure that women everywhere have access to critical nutrition services, to antenatal care during pregnancy and postpartum, to safeguard their health, but also to ensure that their babies are born with a healthy start in life. I could have said it shorter. Healthy mothers, healthy babies. Now, our mission is that we really want to improve maternal nutrition. And we want to do that by collective actions of the consortium members, of all of us, I hope, on this call. And we want to accelerate the availability and the effective news, new, sorry, the effective use of these 15 minerals and vitamins um, and specifically make them more affordable. It is our belief that all women, regardless of who they are, where they live or what they do, they all have a right to access a healthy diet, health services, and a central part of that could be MMS or should be MMS. And I believe that together we will be able to achieve this vision. So when we started a couple of months ago, outlining the role of this consortium, we started by listening to you. In a consultation process, we asked nutrition directors, government leaders, academics, researchers, donors, and you all told us that you wanted this platform in the next slide to be inclusive, collaborative, and comprehensive. You also mentioned what you saw as roles for such a platform, not implementation, but rather an advocate, being a convener and a consensus builder and a knowledge broker. So we listened carefully and we have um, translated these inputs into two documents. The first document is a strategic framework and the second is actually our governance structure. Both documents have been elaborated together with a steering committee and they have approved the versions that currently are on the website and you'll see that address later. We have launched a website for healthy mothers, healthy babies. We specifically welcome your views and suggestions regarding the strategic framework. We still consider that a draft until the members of this consortium have had a chance to comment on it. In the strategic framework, we also speak about the strategic objectives, which is next. So we have four that are formulated. The first objective is really overarching. It is defining a common agenda of joint responsibility. And then the second, third and the fourth are actually related to the roles that we have defined. So the second strategic objective is about accelerating and amplifying advocacy at global health level. And where helpful, we can support consortium members in their efforts for advocacy at the country and the national level. And then the third objective is about that convening. We really want to provide a neutral platform to facilitate dialogue and to bring together stakeholders and key influencers to talk about those themes and issues that you find important. And fourthly, as a knowledge broker, we will capture and share information in a knowledge hub on the website, but also proactively. Now, ultimately, this is all about shared ownership for the work. And importantly, that we, we also want to make smart use of resources and avoid any duplication of investments or efforts at every level. Now, next, I will talk a little bit about how, about how we operate. Um, we mentioned in the mission statement, we operate through collective actions with the consortium members. Now, for the members, we will be intentional in our outreach. We specifically want to create the space for the representatives of national authorities, national implementers to join. But we also welcome private sector. We believe that their expertise and know-how in manufacturing or distribution are essential for scaling up. Now, operationally, there's a small team that is hosted by the Micronutrients Forum. We are responsible for the daily management. And we call it the secretariat, consisting of a program lead, me, and an advocacy manager. And we are also lucky to have um, the support of other Micronutrients Forum staff. More important and very crucial is the steering committee. The role of the steering committee is to provide direction, guidance, and support. And I, at this moment, would like to express a special thank 
to those steering committee members that are already in place and that have given us a significant amount of their time and their effort in the past months to get where we are today. Currently, you see on the, on the screen that the committee is um, having these members. These are all people with exceptional technical expertise and long-standing experience. At the same time, we do recognize that there is shortcoming in representation. There's a lack of national leadership and perspective. So therefore, I now would like to make a call. Please nominate representatives from national governments, civil society, implementers to join the steering committee. Take time, you take time to consider leaders and voices that you would like to take place in that committee. And I believe that that is needed, that that will help us to make the success of the consortium. So that was the first call of action. Now going to the membership and how to apply. We did receive a number of questions already about what does this membership entail? And for the details, I'm going to refer you again to the website and to the governance document that clearly describes a membership engagement policy. Here, I'm only setting out a couple of highlights. First, that the application process has three steps, quite simple. You fill in an application form on the website. The secretariat will process those forms and then we will give a recommendation to the steering committee who makes a decision ultimately to approve or not approve, rather to approve. There are a number of eligibility criteria because we are looking for members that are active in this area, that are, have activities or services that align with the mission of the consortium. We also would like active members in the sense that we would like them to bring added value, meaningful added value to the work and the agenda that we're looking for. In alignment with the United Nations and for instance, also the scaling up nutrition movements, we also have stated that we will exclude organizations that are producers of certain substances like alcohol, tobacco and breast milk substitutes. We hope that you will apply in big numbers after this um, webinar. Now going to the activity plan. What is, in, what, is, what is in scope for 2021? How will we move after this launch? Time is of essence. And as Andy said, 2021 is a vital and crucial year for nutrition. Many things coming up. And we have an ambitious agenda for this year. We will start by co-creating, jointly developing a global strategy and a 2030 roadmap. So we're looking far ahead. We also are looking more close by and want to, together with you, define the advocacy agenda for this year to, so that we leverage all those um, events and great moments and that we are going to the party and not waiting to be invited. And for the advocacy agenda, besides the scientific arguments, we really want to lend the, vo the voice of women there. We want to bring pregnant women frontline health workers, mothers to the table, so that we have our arguments, not only from the heads, but also from the heart. We are planning one or two or maybe more technical expert meetings that have a lens on where the need is greatest. And in the consultation late last year, we already heard that there's an urgent need of creating regional or national manufacturing capacity so that we can ensure availability and affordability of multiple micronutrient supplements. And finally, in the coming two months, we will elaborate the Knowledge Hub on our website. And thereafter, we will facilitate more proactive knowledge sharing through webinars and hopefully very soon also face-to-face -face meetings. Now, what's next? We want to keep the momentum that was created this week by the launch of the Lancet series and now by the launch of this consortium. So to do this, we will work together every step of the way with you so please mark in your calendars these two upcoming consultations, these two dates, 31st of March and 21st of April. They are targeted convenings for prospective members, a little bit a smaller community than today. We will need to be able and make this a workshop webinar. And we're looking for people that are willing to invest some time in the preparation or maybe the elaboration of the outputs of these workshops. 
and more details on the workshops will follow. Now the next I do, I know that I have spoken a lot, I will soon stop, so don't worry, you will find all the documents and the information on the website. And here is the address, very simple, hmhbconsortium.org. And I'd like to close with a sincere thank you. I believe we have made good progress till now, but we can only make exceptional progress if we work together with you. And that's what I'm doing. I'm looking forward to working together with you over the coming months. Jane, I'm going back to you because there may be a number of questions. Thank you so much, Marty. It's really exciting. I just love that idea of that finally, and it just seems so strange that we're only having it now, but finally, we're going to have a dedicated organization consortium for women, mothers, those absolutely critical people. I always think of a saying we have in South Africa, which says, when you strike a woman, you strike a rock. We really are the powerhouses. And yet at the same time, we've seen how COVID-19, who's taken the harshest uh, effects of COVID-19, the woman. And yet who are the people that have also really put themselves out there and most of the frontline workers, the woman. So absolutely now is the time. Marty, in the minute that we have left, I'm going to ask you a question that we have about what role do you see for organizations that actually consider themselves in the nutrition sensitive programming uh, towards uh, their involvement in this consortium? That is an excellent question. And um, um, I actually think there's a huge role because though, though we say, you know, um, this is about maternal nutrition. And yes, the start is a focus on multiple micronutrient supplements because the evidence is there, because it needs to be scaled up. There are so many other interventions, right? So um, also in antenatal care, um, we have counseling of the mothers about healthy diets, but we need the access to the healthy diet. So I definitely believe that there is a big role also for those organizations that are working on nutrition sensitive um, aspects. We, I know that there are people say, why do you only talk about MMS and why not about other interventions? And it's my hope that we will get there in the, in the future. But to be honest, this is a baby. I mean, this is about maternal nutrition, but the organization is still small, is still new. We need to focus and we cannot do it all at the same time. So we want to put our efforts at this moment behind MMS but I can say that in the future, we do want to make sure that there's sufficient attention for all the other aspects. Thanks so much, Marty, and I, I'm excited. My application is going to be headed your way. Everybody, remember we said we have to make the difference. And if maternal uh, and it, nutrition is really where you're passionate about, you found your home right here. So as we come towards the end of our time together, I have a real pleasure and privilege of asking someone who I think needs no introduction, in fact, to actually give us her closing some remarks and her thoughts from having listened. And there you see on the screen, it's a pleasure to have Anna Lati with us. Anna was most recently the head of nutrition uh, at the FAO, really putting nutrition on the FAO's agenda. She also before that served as the past chair of the IUNS, uh, where she represented Africa as the first African to chair it and did some amazing things uh, while she was president. And she has really dedicated her life to supporting and promoting not only nutrition, but very much at her heart is maternal and child nutrition. And Anna is now back at home in Ghana. And once again, I see affiliated to the University of Ghana, the circle goes round. Anna's been listening intently uh, to what she's heard, what she's seen going on in the Q&A box. So Anna, you have the task of just sharing with us uh, for five minutes, some of the thoughts that have really come to your mind as we enter into the start of this exciting consortium. Over to you, Anna. Thank you very much, Jane, for the kind introduction. 
I also want to thank uh, Maddie and the team for inviting me to give the closing remarks on this very important launch. Uh, we have heard from the researchers, from the country implementers, from advocacy. I think that all the presentations have really laid down a good foundation for me to give the closing remarks that I will be saying. First of all, I think that it's very gratifying to see that this consortium is going to focus on women and babies. I mean, what a laudable effort and, and vision to have. That's really great. The next I want to say is that when the sustainable development goals came into action, we said uh, the leaders pledged that to leave no one behind. I mean, you will all agree with me from the situation as we have it now in terms of nutrition situation, if we do not do something concrete, something different, and if we continue with business as usual, a lot of people are going to be left behind. And most likely it will be the women and the children. I mean, Jane, you mentioned what happened, what has happened with COVID. Women are bearing the brunt of it and we need to do business differently. We have the opportunity. We have seen the opportunities that have come. The Lancet series came out with clear messages which were just presented to us. So for me, I think this is good news. We have good news. The good news is that we have the evidence to act and we must act. So I would like to just make three key points. The first is that fighting malnutrition is like fighting an enemy. You use all the tools available to use. It's not choose and pick. In this case, the use of micro, in addressing micronutrient deficiencies, there are several options. And micronutrient supplements certainly is one option we should look at, it's ripe for use. The evidence is there, we should be looking at it. Other in, in, interventions include fortified foods, biofortified crops and all. But keeping in mind that, you know, these will actually fill the gap when considering that healthy diets are not accessible to all. The evidence that came was that healthy diet is not accessible to about, it's not affordable to about 3 billion people. A majority of these, if you look at the map, distribution map, you see that quite a number are actually on the African continent. So we should try and get them options, get ourselves options, options for our mothers. And so we need multiple micronutrients to step in to actually fill the gap until healthy diets become available. The second point I want to mention is that this is the time to act. We have all heard about the global opportunities, the Lancet series, the Nutrition for Growth, the Decade of Action on Nutrition, which has been declared several years ago. We are in the midterm of it. And also we have the Sustainable Development Goals. And now we are having the Food System Summit. These are global opportunities that we can use to actually do something differently. It will be a real loss for nutrition if at the end of 2021, we do not make a dent in the nutrition situation, especially for the mothers and children. And my final point is that we need all hands on deck. No one can do it alone. We want to bring everybody on board, but each and every one has can make a difference. You can make a difference, but we can make a difference when we work together to move this mountain of micronutrient deficiencies in women and children. I think our generation has all the knowledge and the tools and the evidence to make a difference. It is for this reason that we are calling on all of you to join the consortium and let's move micronutrients out. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anna. And again, I just love that the whole focus of this launch and the words you've used, the words our speakers have used is there's good news, there's hope. And right now is the best time to create the tomorrow we want for the world's mothers and children. So thank you so much, Anna. And lovely to see you back on the screen, Saskia, as you're going to close off the session for us. Yes, thank you, Jane, and thank you, Anna, for your thoughtful reflections. And I'm really so happy that you have recently also joined the Micronutrient Forum board because 
you continuously uh, remind us to act um, and to also uh, remind us that there are no silver bullets in nutrition. And I think um, we have several options to choose from and that each of us have a role to play, but we, that we need to collaborate more together. And that I think is really the essence of what we are trying to, to do here today. Um, and I think this has been a real amazing webinar. I really um, love to hear from the excellent speakers. Um, and, and I think it's created an enormous amount of questions in the, the, in the Q&A section, uh, showing an, an interest, an, a huge interest that there is out there uh, for, this, for this work and lots of food for thought. And you know, this is only the start. Um, we hope that you, all of you will be with us on this journey uh, to come and to support that challenge that we have chosen to move forward, especially this year, but also beyond this year. So in this special week, uh, we have seen that, you know, with, uh, with the International Women's Day, with the Lancet Nutrition Series, that it's really prime time now to stand up and act together for MMS and to scale it up and move it into programs. So I would like to thank you all for your attendance, but I would also like to remind you and call upon you to join us. Have a look at the website that Marty described and become a, consider becoming a member of Healthy Mothers, Healthy Babies and contact us in case you're interested or in case you have more questions or in case you have suggestions, for instance, uh, regarding the draft strategic framework. And there was a question already on the strategic framework. So we would love to hear your input on this. And finally, come and work with us uh, because we cannot do this alone. And um, let us know if you're interested in also the upcoming workshops, um, uh, workshop webinars that will, uh, we will have more information on these webinars coming out soon. And finally, I would like to express my uh, sincere gratitude to all the speakers, to Jane for an excellent moderation, for, to uh, Marty van Leer and Ainsley Morris, who have been really working behind the scenes um, around the clock to make this, uh, this event happening today. And, and again, um, a warm thank you to the current donors of this symposium, Kirk Humanitarian and SIF. And with this, I would like to close uh, this session. I would like to thank you very much for your attendance. And I look forward to uh, meeting you again uh, during uh, the follow-up webinars. Thank you. Bye.